So we're in the book of Joshua this morning, and we're going to read Joshua uh, chapter 7. Amen? All right, here we go. Start in verse 1. Joshua 7, verse 1. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor there, for there are but a few. So you got to understand that if you go back and you read Joshua chapter 6, they're coming off the great victory of Jericho. And what happened in the great victory of Jericho is that God distinctly gave them specifications. I want you to walk around. Y'all remember the story. I want you to walk around the city one time only for each day for six days. On the seventh day, you're going to send the priest out there with the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God. And on that day, you're going to walk around there seven times. You're going to blow the trumpets. You're going to shout the war cry, amen, and the walls are going to come down. Praise God. God showed up on that day for them, and there was a great victory that took place. But he also told him on that day, don't take of the accursed thing. And so we see in the early part of this chapter that they did take of the accursed thing. And what we see here now is that they go up to spy out the land of Ai, which is the next the next city, if you will. See, Jericho, let me just explain that to you, too. I mean, I preached it before. But Jericho was a stronghold that stood in the way of them, really, as soon as they crossed over the Jordan River. What you got to understand is, is that the Red Sea represents our salvation Old Testament-wise. In other words, God caused them to take the lamb to shed its blood to paint the doorposts and the signposts <laughs> representing the blood of Jesus amen and judgment came upon the land that night but he delivered his people out of the world out of the bondage of Pharaoh Pharaoh representative of the enemy Egypt representative of the world when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you put your faith in his blood that was shed for your sin it's like a mass exodus takes place he translates you Colossians 1 13 from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. A transference takes place. A translation takes place. He moves you through the Red Sea on the other side. Amen. But many times in the journey of Christianity, there's also a wilderness experience. A place where the child of God, just like the children of Israel, has not come to the place where they desire or they will willingly bow the knee completely to God. So the children of Israel had wandered for 40 years, but then God was going to bring them under the leadership of Joshua across the Jordan River. Crossing the Jordan represents us moving into the promises of God. It represents the place where we begin to get a revelation that we really do want to live for God. That we're really desiring to leave the world that we used to live in and all of the things that we loved about the world. We want to leave it behind because we're becoming convinced that it no longer holds anything for us. Amen? Amen. And so they crossed over the Jordan. So as soon as the children of Israel cross over Jordan, and here's Jericho. It's this huge stronghold. It's got these big old walls. And you're not going to be able to fight. You, you, you know, you need intervention from God. That's one of the things that you and I need to understand. Whenever we're going to cross over Jordan, we're going to be able to walk in the victory of God. We're going to quit being on the defense and start being on the offense and start being used as a disciple, a learner of Christ, start being used as a soldier for the living God. But guess what? Jericho is going to have to fall. And you are going to scale that wall and defeat the inhabitants of Jericho in and of your own strength. You're going to need intervention from God, the Holy Ghost, showing up in the midst of your life and destroying it for you. Amen. Just as for the children of Israel, trusting in, putting faith in, the God of it, uh, th that they served showing up for them, the same thing goes for you as New Testament Christians. You have to keep your faith in the intervention that God has sent, which was the giving of His Son, the dying on the cross, which shed, which made you now righteous in the eyes of God, now gives you access to His presence, where grace can flow, where the Holy Spirit moves in you and through you, and now He takes the fight to the enemy. He 
causes the walls of Jericho to fall in the midst Amen. of your life. Amen? But at the same time, each of us know that even once we've had a revelation and an understanding of the scriptures and know to, that we're supposed to keep our faith in Jesus, the enemy don't quit. And just as Jericho fell, I'm telling you right now, you'll see some victories in your life. There's an AI right behind there. There's an AI right behind there, and you send some men to spy out the land, and you're like, hey, the Lord knocked down Jericho. We only need to send a few men over there because they just got a little bitty old crew, and we're about to put it on them. And the reality of it is, is that there's something hidden in the story, and you realize it doesn't turn out the way that they want it to. And it says right here, verse 4, so there went up there of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. Can you see that? I mean, they just took off running. I'm not going to take off running right now, but they, they, I mean, they, they just running, and they're looking behind, and they're trying to get away. The men of Ai smote them, about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Hmm. And Joshua ripped his clothes. What does that mean? That means he tore his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening time. Now, you realize that, once again, every time we see the, the, the ark of the Lord, we've got to remember that's the presence of God. So Joshua, in his distress, I mean, we've got to understand there's, emotional, there's an emotional situation taking place here. If you've ever been in the midst of a situation where you experienced a defeat, where you experience, it, it, it many times it's traumatic. It causes an emotional disturbance on the inside of you. And we see that in Joshua. He's responding emotionally. He rips his clothes because that's what Jewish men used to do. He rips his clothes. He falls upon his face in front of the ark. He's getting into the presence of God. He's crying out to God, not just for a little bit, but for quite some time until the evening tide. And then it says right here <laughs> that in verse 7, I'm sorry. Until evening tide, he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And I've told you that before, but they rub ashes on themselves. They wear sackcloth. They'd rip their clothes and put dust on their head. All of these things representing something uncomfortable. I know it looks like a silly scene if you watch some man from a distance doing this. But what they're doing is, is that they're mourning over the defeat in their life, over the sin in their life. They're coming to a realization that they've transgressed God. Something's wrong and they're desiring to make it right with the Lord. It says right here in verse 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ around us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? After all this, Lord, you know, you brought us out of Egypt. You, you brought us over the Red Sea. You caused Jericho to fall. And now that all this has happened, now the enemy is going to gain victory over us? And what's going to happen when the Canaanite sees that? What's going to happen when the rest of the inhabitants of the land and all of your enemies see that you brought us over here, but yet at the same time, you're no longer with us and destruction is happening and, 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 and we're being defeated. And, and the same thing happens for the New Testament Christian. Whenever he begins to see failure in the midst of his life, he begins to feel unworthy. He begins to feel as though he's defeated and the enemy sees that. Listen to me. And he's like a shark in water that smells blood and he goes out after that and he begins to bring condemnation and he heaps it upon your head and he makes you feel even more unworthy and it get, listen it can get so bad I'm telling you that you end up in a valley and that's what I'm preaching to you about this morning I'm preaching you, to you about the valley and he says uh, verse 10 and the Lord said unto Joshua get thee up wherefore liest thou thus upon your face I remember that time that he told Samuel, he said, get up. Why do you still mourn for Saul? He, he, Saul has transgressed my ways. Get up, fill your horn with oil, and go anoint one of Jesse's boys. Quit your crying. Get up off your face. There's a time for crying, and there's a time Amen. for standing. Amen. Amen. And what the Lord's telling Joshua is, get up off your face. Stand up like a man. I'm going to tell you what the problem is here. This is the problem. Israel has sinned. 
And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even amongst their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs. What does that mean? They turned around and they started running. Before the enemies, because they were accursed, neither will I be with you anymore, except to destroy the accursed thing from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 15. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of, of the Zerhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Now, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, to some extent, I kind of talked about this in the message, but I, don't, I think it's important. He, he, he's basically begging. He's saying, you got to come clean. What I want to say this morning is, is there's a part to this message where the believer has to come clean. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even saying that you got to come clean with another man. Amen. What I'm saying is, is that you got to come clean between you and the Lord. Amen. And you got to recognize that the way that you've been handling your business in whatever way, shape, or form it's been hasn't been right. And if you continue to go in that direction, guess what? You're not going to be able to stand against your enemies, whatever that may mean. Sometimes we have a tendency to automatically allow our thoughts to flood towards adultery and fornication and doing drugs and drinking and smoking dope or nicotine and all of these sins of vice. But the reality of it is, is that there's a whole lot more to it than that. The reality of it is, is that sometimes we just don't treat people properly. Sometimes we're very selfish in our mindsets. Sometimes we don't have the life of Christ in us where he was giving, laying self down and obedient to the Father. And instead, we're hold, we, we want what we want. And, and, and what we end up doing is we hurt other people in the process. People try to give to us and help us and we take, take, take. And we don't even realize how much we're taking from them. And we don't even appreciate what it is that they're doing for us. And and we continue to live our lives that way and we wonder why we find ourselves in financial disarray. We wonder why we find ourselves in a big old mess. We treat people wrong in relationships and we wonder why we feel the way that we do You know, when we're being treated improperly. And all I'm trying to say is, is that there's a whole lot more to this than just the sins of vice that used to plague your life. But there's, a, there's motives of the heart and there's the way that we treat other people. And if we think that the Lord doesn't see it and that the yeah. Lord's not watching. Listen to me. you got to get a revelation in your heart and in your mind that sometimes we don't do things right. Sometimes we don't do things the way the Lord would have us to do it. And until we allow Him to make a change in us and we begin to change the way that we're operating, we're going to find ourselves continuing on in the midst of a valley. I know I haven't given you even the title of the message this morning, but just remember it's about a valley. Amen? Uh, <laughs> All right. So it says right here, Verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. I got them where I live. And the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. 
And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned him with fire. After they had stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the valley of Achor unto this day. I titled this morning's message, The Valley of Decisions. Anybody that's really read much of the Bible, you know that there's a scripture in the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 14, that says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's not what I'm talking about today. Everybody's got, each and every human being ever born and ever breathed breath upon the face of this earth will have to come to a place where they find themselves in the valley of decision. Amen. Where they're going to have to make a determination on who they're going to serve. Whether they will give their heart to God or not. I'm talking about this morning. And you find yourself in the midst of a valley based upon your decisions. You're in the valley of decisions. You've made decisions in the midst of your life. You find yourself in the midst of this valley. And you can't hardly get out of the valley. You don't know what in the world you're going to do to get out of the valley. And you don't understand how did I end up in this valley. Most of the time, many times, it's based upon decisions that you made. But I haven't done anything wrong lately, preacher. Well, maybe not. Maybe it was a decision you made a long time ago. I know this one lady that lives in Homa. I don't think she watches any of the videos, so I'll just go ahead and say it. A long time ago, she was raised in church. She went to church all of her life. Then she backslid. She backslid from the Lord. In the midst of her backslidden state, she married a man that didn't serve the Lord. He may be serving the Lord now. I don't know, but the last I heard he wasn't. He didn't serve the Lord. She connected herself to that man. And now after a period of time, she wanted to serve the Lord again. He don't want to have nothing to do with Jesus. Guess what? She's in the midst of a valley based upon decisions that she made. Sometimes they're not that drastic. Sometimes it's decisions that we make on a daily basis. You understand what I'm saying? Once again, the way that we treat people or interact in our business with people. You think that you cheat on your taxes all of the time? You think that you shortchange the Lord? Come on, somebody. Y'all know I'm not a money preacher, but you think you're going to shortchange the Lord? You think you're going to do dirty deals uh, with other people? People, and especially brothers and sisters in the Lord, treat them improperly when they're given unto you. And if the Lord doesn't see that, and you're not going to find holes in your pocket where the palmer worm and the canker worm are going to eat it away at your finances and everything that you have. No, that's not the way that it works. The Lord sees it. You sow seed like that, you're going to reap a harvest like that. Sometimes it's decisions where people manipulate our lives and cause us to, you know, they, they pound us with the idea that I'm not going to serve the Lord. I don't want to serve the Lord. And before you know it, if we start listening to the words that they speak, then it's going to start to infiltrate us. Before you know it, I don't even, I'm not even as concerned about the things of God as I used to be. I don't even, the word of God doesn't even affect me the way that it used to affect me. All oh, the preacher don't preach the way that he used to preach. The preacher, something's wrong with him. No, maybe something's wrong with you. And maybe something is wrong with the preacher. But maybe something's wrong with you. Maybe your heart has become hard towards the things of God and towards the word of God. Amen. And that in reality, things aren't going the way that you wanted them to go. All right. And so what it says right here, though, is this. What I want you to know, what I need you to know is, is that there's a place of defeat located in the valley. And in this valley, the psalmist said that there's a shadow of death that's cast over the, the valley. And, and, and that there's unscalable walls in the midst of this valley. The walls are so high. That the reality of it is, is that many times that the light of the sun of the day can't enter in and it causes darkness. And where there's darkness, there's a lack of light. And where there's no light, you can't see right. Amen. And, and spiritually, Christians often find themselves in this hopeless filling valley. This valley where they don't know how in the world they're ever going to get out of it. And in the valley, hope is destroyed. And if you stay there long enough. If you stay in the valley long enough, it can lead to spiritual death. 
And what I, I want to show you another valley in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. In Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you. That's talking about tissue and cartilage and ligaments. And bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And, 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 and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, what they may live, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dry, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our part. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Is that in one story we have a situation where God leads Joshua to take Achan and all that stuff that he has and bring it into a valley. In other words, what I want you to know is that sometimes it's the Lord's will that we end up in the midst of the valley. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit more about what I'm talking about there. God has a purpose in the valley. But the valley is not a place where you're supposed to stay. The valley is not a place where you're supposed to stay to where you show up in the valley and you take a look and it's full of the dead bones, dried up, no juice left in them, of God's people. God's people were never intended to die short of the promised land and end up in a valley full where they were dead and had no life in the midst of them. And whenever you and I look at this valley and it's filled with dead bones and it's dried up and there's no juice left in it, our mind from the natural perspective views this and says, how in the world can anything good come out of this? How in the world can we ever get out of this situation? The valley is dark. The valley is harsh. The valley hurts. There's no light of God in it because God's light is being obscured by the darkness in the midst of our life. And such a difficult task it is to try to climb out of the valley in one's own strength. You see him, he's, he, you're so far down. There, there's so much energy to expend just, just to try to get your foot back on level ground. And what I need you to know is, is that that's where the battle takes place. Just a place to get where the soldier can engage the battle. And that he's not running in the opposite direction of the enemy, but that he's on the offensive. And he's being used as a witness. Amen. Well, what, I mean, God hasn't called me to preach on the street. Well, good. Do you have a friend that comes over to your house and drinks coffee with you? Do you have somebody that you know that's not really serving the Lord at at work or some other place that you can engage them as you're eating a sandwich over lunch and just kind of tell them a little bit about what God has done in the midst of your life. Amen. But no, if we're in the midst of the valley and everything's obscured in the darkness and we got stuff hidden in our life, the reality of it is, is this, is that we're not going to be on the offensive. We're going to be running in the opposite way. 
In the valley, he struggles to get out. Whoever he is, whoever she is, she's struggling to get out. The arms are feeble. You're dehydrated. Have you ever tried to accomplish something physically when you're dehydrated and you're feeble and you're weak and you're worn out and you don't feel like you can go any further? I don't know about you, but have you ever been there spiritually? Have you ever been there spiritually where you just can't hardly take another step? Where you feel as though you're crawling just to get where it is that you're needing to go? Everyone else, you blame it on everybody else around you a lot of times. No, oh, it's everybody else's fault. No, no, not today. It's not everybody else's fault. It's your own fault that you find yourself in the valley because you made decisions. You can blame it on everybody else, but you've been making the same decisions all of your life. Amen. And God's trying to bring you to a place where you got to face the decisions that you've made that put you there to begin with because he wants to deal with them right here and now. He wants to leave them under a pile of stones. Amen. Yeah, amen. He said there's no wind down there. He's hot. He's dehydrated. He's feeling hopeless. He's never going to get out. He's climbing and he thinks he's making progress. And then another financial crisis. Another relationship crisis. Another failure towards sin to numb the pain, which further darkens the valley, makes the likelihood of victory seem even further and further away. And it just looks exactly like the valley of all these dry, dead bones. And it just seems so hopeless. Yeah. And we have no help. And how in the world are we ever going to get out? Oh, but the Lord told Ezekiel, amen, prophesy to them bones, son of man. And what you and I need to understand is that we're never going to get out. Without the intervention of the Lord. Amen. Yes. We're never going to be able to get out. But so I got four things that I want to talk to you about. Four points that I want to talk to you about regarding the, to learn from the valley. Amen. You ready? Point number one. Back in Joshua chapter 7, verses 11 through 13. It says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. And so what I want you to know is, is that point number one is this. Holding on to and hiding the sin of the world in your life will prevent victory from coming. The word of God was clear. Achan had taken the Babylonish garment. I don't know exactly what that means, but Babylon was famous. A lot of trade went through there. It was probably a silken garment. It was probably beautiful with dyes of that time and colors of thread that you couldn't just get anywhere. It looked beautiful. I'm sure it felt good against your skin. Whatever the case, he wanted it. He took it. Not only that, he took some silver and some gold, but the crazy thing is, is that he put it in the midst of his tent. He had it all up in the midst of his dwelling. He allowed it to become part of who he was. And listen to me, the children of God, even today, oftentimes will reach out and grab a hold of things of the world and bring them into their dwelling, bring them into their lives and hold on to them. And then we wonder why we're in the midst of a valley. We wonder why we're in the midst of a place of defeat. And we wonder why, Lord, why haven't you given me victory over this enemy in my life, whatever that enemy is, whatever that struggle may be. And the Lord's saying, until you get rid of the accursed thing, that hidden thing, See, you might have hidden it from everybody else, but you'll never hide it from me because I'm the one that knows how many hairs you got on your head. I formed you while you were in your mother's womb. I know the steps you're going to take tomorrow. It's time for you to be able to allow this thing to be dealt with in the midst of the valley. God's answer to Joshua is for him to get off his face. You remember that? He said Joshua's on his face. And God's answer to Joshua is get off your face. My people have sinned. There's no confusion here. There's no, you don't have to be bewildered. In reality, let me give you the answer, Joshua. The people have taken of the accursed thing. And they've hidden it in the midst of their lives. And so you don't have to lay here on the ground crying. What you got to do is you got to get up and you got to deal with it. Because people are clinging to and they're hiding on to, they're holding on to sin in the midst of their life. So don't allow the hidden thing to remain. Well, how do I, how do I get rid of that? Well, you come clean with the Lord. That was the point that I wanted to make to you. You got to come clean with the Lord. When the Holy Spirit begins to move upon your heart 
And he begins to move upon your mind. He begins to reveal those things to you. Amen. Sometimes it's not gold or Babylonian garments, you know, something, whatever it is. You, and he reveals to you what that is. Then you bring it to him and you say, Lord, please deal with this situation Amen. in the midst of my life. Amen. And if you're sincere, he's going to deal with it. Sometimes we think we're more sincere than what we really are. Though. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? And we're about to get to that. See, that's point number two. Let's read verses uh, 24 and 25. It says, And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned him with fire after they had stoned him with the stones. Point number two. Sometimes it's people and sometimes it's things. But the trouble has to go. You see, Achan's name means the troubler. And the valley of Achor means the place of trouble or the place of disaster. And so I don't know what it is in your life. You don't know necessarily what it is in my life, but sometimes it's people and sometimes it's things. Whatever those things or people are, the reality of it is, is that they're the, the source of the trouble that we've brought into the midst of our life. And, and the reality of it is, is that God's saying, as long as you allow that to stay there and you're asking me for victory, it's not going to happen. Those things in your life need to die and they need to be left under a pile of rocks when you're done with them. If you invite trouble, you're going to get trouble. Amen. Amen. Whether it be worldly pleasures of the flesh that we disobey God with or people that we allow into our lives that bring trouble through their sinful ways, in order for us to move out of the valley where there's nothing but darkness and move into the place where there is light, we will have to come to the place where we are willing to no longer let the people or the Amen. sin have control over our lives. We may be in the valley today, but when we leave, those things, once again, need to be buried under a pile of rocks as we exit on our way to victory that God has secured for us. Amen? So number one, you can't have it hidden. Number two, hallelujah, you need to allow those things to die. Number three, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 3. I'm, I'm, I'm switching gears on you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. If you remember this story, this is the story I love. This is probably my favorite story in the Old Testament. This is the story where the big giant, Goliath, is standing on one side, and he's screaming across the valley to the children of Israel. And every morning, this same thing happens again and again for 40 days. Uh, the giant wakes up, stretches, I guess, yawns, gets over there, rubs some nasty food off his beard, and starts screaming at the children of Israel, calling them cowards. Young David shows up one day to bring some, sheep, some, some cheese and some wine to his brothers, and he sees what's going on. And he says, what in the world is taking place here? This uncircumcised Philistine is defying the armies of God, our God. He's not only defying the armies of our God, but he's also defying, he's defying our God's name. He's defying you. Why do you sit here like, that's what he's thinking. Why do you sit here like a bunch of cowards? And did you, by the way, did you say that somebody that kills him gets the king's daughter for his wife? And so immediately, young David, the point that I'm trying to make is, is this, is that in order to move on to victory, you almost certainly will have to go through the valley. If you're going to move from the point of defeat to the point of victory, you're going to have to go through the valley. And on that day, young David, he did. He went through the valley. I can still, I think of it like this because I can see him almost like one of them, like, I think he's probably agile. I just want to think of David as athletic. I mean, he killed a lion and a bear as a young boy. I mean, he killed this, this Goliath. I mean, you know he's quick. He's nimble. He's not a real big man. And I can just see him, like, bouncing down on these rocks as he goes down into the valley. He's just real nonchalant. He sees the smooth stones in the brook kid drawn, and he just picks 
picks them up. He, he knows there's five of them. He can spot them out because you know why? He's, he's been practicing with that sling for so long. He knows what the best stones that fly, the best, the most true look like. And he, he selects those stones. And I, I bet you like without even thinking twice. I mean, I'm sure his heart's beating a little bit, but the Holy Spirit's with him. You know what I'm saying? Amen. The Holy Spirit's with him. He's walking in a confidence and a boldness yes. that's not of his own. Amen. Yeah, he's put the practice in. He's put the time in. He read the scriptures. Amen. He didn't, he didn't put his trust in, but he knew his God. That's why he read the scriptures. He strung the heart, and the reason why he worshiped the Lord wasn't because he thought he was going to earn something with God, but that he loved him, and he wanted to get to know him. He spent his time. He put his time in the presence of God, and I'm just telling you, I can just see him right now without even breaking stride, and he just, and he knocks that giant down. The, but he had to go through the valley. He had to go through the valley and get over to the other side. And what I'm trying to tell you this morning is this, is that you're going to have to go through the valley if you're ever going to get to that place of victory. Let me explain to you why. See, the valley, once again, just like I've said it once before, the valley was never meant to be a place where you stayed. It was never meant to be a place filled with the dead bones of God's people. It was meant to be a passageway towards victory. It was supposed to be the place where the things and people that were in trouble were destroyed and left behind as we marched on towards the goal of becoming victorious in Christ. Young David was quickly fed up with the words of the giant. See, that's the difference between young David, the shepherd boy, and everybody else that was in the camp. It didn't take him very long to figure out we got a problem here. Whenever he heard the way that this giant, this enemy of God, was speaking against God and against God's people, immediately he had a problem with what was going on. He said, I don't know how long y'all can live like this. If y'all been putting up with this for 40 days, then y'all are fools. I'm not going to put up with this for another 40 seconds. I'm about to stand up. Hallelujah and go through this valley and trust God to give me victory on the other side. What I'm trying to tell you is this, that many people are willing to allow the giants to remain in the midst of their life. The things that loom over them, the things that cast a shadow over the light of God in the midst of their life, they're willing to put up with it. Well, whatever it may be, you pick your poison. I don't have to spell it out for you. You know the things that have been repeatedly showing up in the midst of your life that cause frustration, that cause confusion. And what I'm here to tell you is this, is that as long as you're willing to allow those giants to stand, as long as you're willing to keep those that wedge of gold and that silver and that Babylonian garment hidden and dug up in the tent in your midst, in your dwelling place, then guess what? You're going to continue to see that giant stand. He's going to continue. You're going to continue to see yourself in that darkened valley and with the purpose of the valley. And see, God will allow you to go to the valley. You realize that? Because, see, he led Joshua to bring the people over there. It was called the Valley of Trouble. You, you sow seeds of trouble, you get trouble. Yeah. God, God, God allows the valley to take place because he wants you to recognize the trouble. He doesn't want you to be happy with living with it. He doesn't want you to be okay with it for it to remain in the midst of your life. He wants to bring you to that place, amen, to where it has to be dealt with. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes people learn to live that way for so long that that's all they know. Mm -hmm. And once again, they see those bones. And it just seems hopeless. And it seems so dark down there. And it seems like they'll never be able to get out. But I'm here to tell you, you can't get out on your own. Amen. But if you'll trust in the God that loves you, amen, the God that sent his son to die for you, the God that gives strength and grace, hallelujah, he will get you through amen. to the other side. Amen. None of them were willing to cross through the valley, but young David, this is why many people never embark on the journey of trying to get to the other side. I've already said it because they're okay with the, the, uh, the, the giants that live in the midst of their lives. So he wants us to get up and he wants us to move forward. He wants us to get over to the other side of victory. So the first question that I have to ask is, is okay, how do I get there? I, I don't know the way. Number four, let the shepherd lead the way. Lead the way. Psalm chapter 23 verse 4. Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I believe young David learned something as he walked through that valley. He walked through a valley. The name of that valley was called Elah. And he wrote this psalm years later. And I believe that that's part of this song. 
That the idea that when he was walking in through that valley, he knew that all the forces of, of hell were against him. He could feel the fear in the children of Israel, but he wasn't fearful. He was able to walk through because he knew that the Lord was with him. I need to tell you something this morning, child of God. I got to remind myself of this sometimes, that the Lord is with his people. Amen. Amen. God is with his children. God is with his people. Even though you find yourself in the valley of where there's a shadow of death cast over you and, and the enemy is trying to convince you that you're not going to make it out and that you're going to end up like Ezekiel's dried up dead bones, I'm here to tell you the Lord is with you Amen. every step of the way on the journey. The way that you're going to get out of the valley, the way that you're going to get led beside still waters, behind green pastures, amen, so that you can be nourished, so that you can be strengthened, so that you can get up and get out, is because you're going to follow the lead of the shepherd. The problem that we have is that many times we don't respond to the valley the way that the young shepherd boy did. I mean, just like we don't mind the giants in our life, sometimes we don't like the direction that the Lord leads us. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, the reality of it is, is that sometimes we like the direction that we're going in. And we don't want the Lord to lead us in a different direction. Feels good. And it feels good. And we want to stay there. Lord, help us. Yes. Help us to have a desire. Allow the valley to do in us what the valley is supposed to do in us. Amen. He knew that the Lord was the shepherd and that the Lord would guide him through. Amen. If we allow him to, he will straighten the crooked places. He will elevate the valleys. He will lower the mountains that are in our way. The obstacles that seem impossible are nothing for him to move. Amen. Amen. God talked about another valley real quick in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 4. He talked about the day that Jesus would come. He prophesied 600 years before Jesus showed up. And he said that there would be a voice. Of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. This was attributed to John the Baptist who came preaching before Jesus ever showed up. And part of the message said that every valley will be exalted. Every mountain, hallelujah, and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough places shall be made plain. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that these are talking about spiritual valleys, spiritual mountains. Spiritual crooked places. And only the God of glory can cause valleys to be lifted up. And cause mountains to be brought down. And to cause crooked places to be made straightened. Amen. What I'm here to tell you is what God was talking about was that Messiah would come. Jesus would come. Hallelujah. And that whenever he did that, he was going to be making a level playing field. See, the enemy has control in people's lives, but it's because they have not allowed Messiah to do his part. Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest for your weary souls. What is he talking about? You need to quit trying to fight the battle in your own strength. You need to give the battle to the Lord. You need to say, Lord, I come to you, Lord, in humility. I come to you, Lord, in brokenness. I can't fight this battle on my own anymore. I can't take one more step, and I don't want to live in this valley anymore, Lord. I'm asking you to give me strength and to lift me up, Lord. I'm asking you to elevate this valley. How Hallelujah. And help me to walk out of here in Jesus' name. How does the shepherd lead us? I got three more small points and then we're going to close. Now in John chapter 10, verse 11. This is how the shepherd is going to lead us. See, point number four was how are we going to get out? We got to, we got to follow the lead of the shepherd. Well, how's he going to lead us? John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus said this. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. See, Jesus sacrificed. I don't I, I know that I'm just telling you something that you already know, but we got to be Amen. reminded of it, brother. Amen. Jesus' sacrifice, he went before us. The good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. Because the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep, verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, you and I can now know the shepherd of our soul. We can have a relationship with him. The truth of the matter is, is that we, we, we think that we come into Christ, we pray a prayer, and, and that now it's all good and done. No, the reality of it is, is that we got to understand that our daily faith in what he did for us at Calvary 
allows us to stay in relationship with Him. Allows us to stay in union with Him. Where we can learn of Him and get to know Him. And the more we get to know Him, the more we begin to be able to hear His voice. Listen to me. Don't, don't take light of this. It says it right here in, in, in John chapter th uh, 10, verses 3 and 4. It says, To him, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep, talking about to the good shepherd, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls his own sheep by name, and he putteth forth his own sheep, and he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, verse 4, for they know his voice. The point that I'm trying to make is this. The good shepherd gave his life so that you and I could know him. The more that we get to know him through understanding his word, through spending time in his presence, the more clearly it is for us to be able to hear him. We begin to be able to discern the difference between his voice and the chatter of the world, the lies of the enemy. You know, the enemy will use other people in the midst of your life to lie to you. You realize that, right? He'll use people in your own home. He'll use people that are friends of yours. And they will lie to you. He will use people that you work with. He will use people that love God, that are in church, that begin to say things to you. And they don't even realize it, but they're harming your walk with God. They're planting seeds of doubt. They're planting seeds of frustration. And, and, and instead, they're making you unhappy with things that are going on around you. And the reality of it is, is this. That is not the voice of the good shepherd. The good shepherd is lowly, he's humble, he's meek, he lays life down for others instead of amen, so that he might be able to exalt us and, and in a sense of exalting us spiritually because that's what Jesus has come to do.